it's time to talk about the chain rule in multivariable calculus. All right, so recall the chain rule from single variable calculus. The derivative of a composite function f of g of x is given by the derivative of the outside function evaluated at the unchanged inside function f primed of g of x times the derivative of the inside function g primed of x. And that's the way I like to talk and think about it. The derivative of the outside evaluated at the unchanged inside times the derivative of the inside. Now we could uh, rewrite this and apply this to a parametrization. For instance, if we have s of t, which is given by composite function f of x of t with that setup, then the chain rule would look like this. It would be s primed of t is equal to, skipping that middle expression, uh, the derivative of the outside guy, f primed evaluated at the unchanged inside guy, x of t times the derivative of the inside guy, x primed of t. And apologies, I do have a habit of referring to functions as guys. All right, again, we could also write this out in differential notation. And oftentimes in uh, single variable calculus, it seems like most teachers and uh, students tend to prefer the prime notation above. However, I think that you'll see that it's more common and I think a little more clear to use the differential notation here in multivariable calculus here. So let's just take a moment and kind of look at this differential notation as it's related to the parametrization, the derivative of the parametrization above. So s primed of t is ds dt, the derivative of s with respect to t. All right, now skipping to the end, x primed of t, well, that's the derivative of x with respect to t given by dx dt. And then this middle guy right here. Now here's where it's sometimes a little harder to wrap our heads around because where does that t go? Well, x is a function of t. And as since t is kind of that hidden kind of variable there, we can talk about the derivative of f with respect to x. All right, so the chain rule for multivariable functions takes on different forms depending on the number of and type of inputs that you have. So consider our function that we've been looking at, our parametrization, s of t is equal to f of x of t. And we have our derivatives written out, as we've seen there. Since s is basically the same thing as f, we can rewrite this as ds dt is equal to ds dx dx dt. And what I mean for that note, what's the difference there? We have df dx here, but we're replacing that f with s, the end result variable that we're interested in. So notice here that something that we don't, yeah, okay, let's just read this. Applying the chain rule multiplies certain derivatives together. It always has. It's the derivative of the outside, in single variable calculus, the derivative of the outside function evaluated at the inside function times another derivative, the derivative of the inside function. The chain rule involves multiplying different derivatives together. Um, and we're gonna get into more on the next slide about this, but we call S the output variable is always the dependent variable. The output depends on the input. If you change the input, the resulting output is going to change. So the output is your dependent variable always. So S is gonna be our dependent variable. T is the independent variable. That's kind of the innermost input. Um, that little guy is just, we, we chuck a T in, send it through some functions, eventually get an output. Uh, on the way to getting that S output, T has to pass through X, kind of an intermediate variable there. So those are what we call things there. And I haven't told you what this picture on the right is, but notice we uh, S, the derivative of S with respect to X, that first kind of vertical line connecting those two points off to the right, the derivative of s with respect to x. And then if you look at the line segment from x to t, and then we say, okay, well, we're gonna have to take the derivative of x with respect to t, and we ended up multiplying those two things together to get this expression, and that's not a coincidence. Okay, so spoiler alert, this is an example of a tree diagram or a branch diagram. So tree diagrams can be really helpful when we're calculating and applying the chain rule. So the first thing we do to generate a tree, a tree diagram is to identify the variable types. We want to identify all the independent variables, and those are always going to be your initial inputs. Uh, so any intermediate variables, any intermediate inputs, and then the number of inputs. Okay, this is talking about types. 
First, we're going to identify the types of variables, and then we're going to talk about what type of a derivative we take given the number of those inputs. So whether or not it's an independent or an intermediate variable, if you have one variable, you're going to have a single variable derivative, d dt, not partial, but little d. We talked about that when we were introduced partials. You know, this is not the same as this. If you have more than one input, be they an intermediate or an independent variable, you're going to take a partial derivative. The branches, what do you do? Well, you always start with your dependent or output variable. And if you back to that last slide, we had our dependent, our S on the top, and then our independent, our T on the very bottom. That's how we're gonna work always. You start with your dependent variable as your topmost point, and then each input, be it intermediate, and then from intermediate to independent, gets a branch. And then you continue that pattern down to subsequent inputs. So here's an example. All right, so let's identify the variables and types and things like that. So first, what do we have? We have let z of x, y be a differentiable function with x is equal to x of t and y is equal to y of t, also differentiable functions of t. Then z is equal to z of x of t comma y of t is gonna be a differentiable function uh, of t with a derivative given by, well, so we start with our dependent variable, our output variable of z. From that, we draw down two branches to our independent variables. I'm sorry, I said the wrong words there. Um, to our intermediate, to our intermediate variable x and y. And then x and y each have one input. So we're gonna, from those x and y nodes, we're gonna draw branches down to that single t independent variable input. Once you have this picture drawn, then we talk about whether or not we're going to need a partial derivative or a so-called, quote, normal single variable derivative. Well, since z has two inputs, z has two inputs, we're going to have partial derivatives with respect to x and y. Now, x and y each only have one input, t. So the derivatives of x and y with respect to t are both going to be standard single variable derivatives. So you have the little lowercase d. Putting this all together, here's the game. I haven't written this or said this, but I'm going to write it now. The pattern to generate the derivative, the derivative of z with respect to t, notice it's always the dependent variable all the way down to the independent variable, in d, and we'll leave it at like that, is going to be given by this pattern. What you do is you multiply vertically down the branches, and then you add the results. So if I were to follow the path down this, branch from z to t, I would get a partial z with respect to x times dx dt. So I'd multiply those guys together. And then if I were to follow the path down the other branch from z to t, I'm going to have those derivatives, the partial of z with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to t. And then finally, I would add the results together to get the derivative. Now there is an alternate notation where you can use primes and uh, partials using subscripts, but I personally think it's really ugly and every text I've ever seen uses um, the differential notation. And so that's what we're gonna stick with as well. So rather than write out a whole bunch of lots of ab abstract examples, we're gonna work a bunch of concrete examples. And there are uh, some detailed explanations and lots of di tree diagrams on the course site as well. So let's start with our first example. Uh, we're gonna find the derivative of z equals xy along a path 
x equals cosine of t, y equals sine of t. Uh, and we're going to evaluate that derivative at t equals pi over 2. So what do we need? We need to draw ourselves a tree diagram. And to draw a tree diagram, we have to identify the number and types of inputs that we have. So first, we have two intermediate inputs. Z takes as its inputs, intermediate inputs, x and y, x and y. Since we have uh, two intermediate in, in inputs, you're going to have partial derivatives with respect to those. Anytime you have more than one input, it's always going to be partial derivatives. Now for our final, our innermost uh, originating input, if you will, the independent inputs, it's t. There's only one of them. And that's because x and y both take an input of t alone. And so they have one independent variable. Since it's only one, we're going to have the so-called regular derivative, if you will. So these guys are going to get partials. That is, those guys are going to get standard single variable derivatives. And to follow our, our uh, path, you start with your dependent variable z. And from z, you draw a branch to each of the intermediate variables. Since there are two of them, you're going to have two branches heading on down here and heading on down here. And those we know are both going to be partial since there are more than one input. And then from those intermediate variables, each of them are going to go down to their independent variable. And since there's only one of them, they're each going to only have one branch each. And since they only have one input, they're going to be regular derivatives, regular, standard. Uh, regular is not a formal word here. So what do you do? You follow your nose down each path, and you multiply the derivatives together. Then you follow your nose down the other path and multiply those derivatives together. Once you've multiplied down, you add your resulting derivatives together. So del, uh, dz dt is given by the partial of x with respect to x, uh, partial of z with respect to x times the derivative of x with respect to t plus the partial of z with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to t, which is kind of hard to say. All right, so let's actually do this calculation then. I tried to color code this a little bit. All right, so the partial of z with respect to x, the red, well, what do we look at there? Well, we take a look at partial of z with respect to x. Well, the derivative of x, y with respect to x, derivative of x is 1. You're left with just y as a constant. Uh, similarly, before we look at the blue, let's go ahead and look at this little guy, uh, the partial uh, with respect to z the partial of z with respect to y, similar logic there, the derivative of xy with respect to y is just x because the derivative of y is going to be 1 and x is a constant. Now in blue, we have the single variable derivative. We're going to look at our x function. And x of t is given by cosine of t. And the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And then I don't have a, oh, I do have a purple pen. So a purple pen, uh, y derivative of y with respect to t is cosine of t. So put all that together, and we've got our derivative. Now, if you're looking at that and you had the thought, but wait a minute, the derivative of z with respect to t, I don't want a derivative that has is with respect to a single variable to have multiple different variables in it. I don't want x and y and t floating around in there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to substitute in for the y and the x expressions by revisiting up here and saying, OK, x is cosine of t. And y is, perhaps I should have used, well, I don't know, we'll, we'll just double up with red here on the, oh no, poor choice, red on red. I'm, I'm sticking with it, though. I've made a decision. We're just going with it. Yep, substituting in for y, you've got sine of t. And then tidying everything up, you've got negative sine squared of t plus cosine squared of t. Caution, that's not negative 1. Uh, that's not uh, sine squared plus cosine squared because of that negative in front. It does not simplify down to just one. Now, last but not least, we just have to evaluate this rig at the input. T is equal to pi over 2. Now, you could write uh, dz dt of pi over 2. But I think you probably, if you've, if you've watched a few of mine now, realize that I, I'm a fan of this vertical bar notation to represent and evaluate this at the value t is equal to pi over 2. So we're going to do that. 
So we'll evaluate an expression of pi over two. Uh, oops, I forgot to fix that. I saw that and meant to, apologies. And then what were we gonna get? Do all that math, end up with negative one for our derivative. So let's do another example. This time we have, we're after the derivative of w with respect to t, where w is the function x, y plus z, where x is cosine of t, y is sine of t, and z is equal to t. All right. So this time we've got three intermediate variables. W is a function of x, y, and z. And each of x, y, and z are each functions of one variable t. And so we have one independent variable of t, the innermost input, if you will. So the derivative count, whoops, let's draw a tree, a tree diagram. All right, I don't have this one written down, so I'm going to wing it. Ready? I can do this w, our dependent variable. How many inputs does w have? It has three inputs. So I'm going to put x here, y here, and z here, going from your dependent to your intermediate variables. Dependent, intermediate, and then last but not least, independent. How many independent variables do we have? Only one, just t. So each of these intermediates is going to terminate at its input of t. Okay, what kind of derivatives are we going to have here? Well, w for these top branches from w to x, y, and z respectively, w has multiple inputs. And so we're going to have partial derivatives. The partial derivative of w with respect to x, the partial derivative of w with respect to y, the partial derivative of w with respect to z. That's, that's not a good enough partial. That's a little bit better. Uh, hard to make partials with this pen for me. All right, now for x, y, and z, how many inputs do they have? They each have one input, so they're going to have your standard single variable derivative, dx, dt, dy, dt, and dz, dt, respectively. So what is our derivative going to be? Well, dw dt. Notice it's given that it's written with a single variable derivative notation, d's instead of partials. Why is that? Because w has only one independent variable. So you can talk about the single variable derivative of w with respect to t. So let's follow our, our nose down these different branches. Well, down this yellow branch, we're going to get the partial of w with respect to x times dx dt. To that, we're going to add the next branch. So this vertical middle branch in orange. Oops, I should maybe highlight this in orange, yellow too. That would help. All right. Now, in orange, what are we going to get? Well, as we follow our nose down this path, we're going to get the partial of w with respect to y times dy dt, plus our last path, our last branch over here, we're going to get the partial with respect to w, uh, I'm sorry, the partial of w with respect to z times dz dt. Now that we have the derivative written out, we're ready to do the calculations. So there it is, copied in far prettier handwriting than I have, at least on a tablet. Okay, so what are we going to do first? Uh, well, let's do the partial with respect to of w with respect to x. So we're going to be looking at this expression up here. Say, all right, what's the derivative of that with respect to x? Well, the derivative of the first expression is just going to be y, and the derivative of z is going to be zero because zero is a constant. All right, that covers that one. Now we're on to dx dt. What, well, dx dt, where's that going to come into play? Well, let's use a highlighter here. Well, that's just derivative of a cosine with respect to t, negative sine of t. Plus, should have started this a little further off to the left. Apologies for that. All right, once again, uh, the partial of w with respect to y. Well, that's going to be the first expression, x, y. The y is going to have a derivative of 1, so we're going to be left with just x. Derivative of z with respect to y is 0. And now we're ready to take uh, dy, dt. 
derivative of sine with respect to t, derivative of sine with respect to t is cosine of t. Whoops. Oh, no, I'm going to lose my highlighter here. Cosine of t. To that, we are going to now add. Whoops, no, not what I wanted. That really doesn't want to stay highlighted, does it? All right, plus, last but not least, we have dw, or a partial of w with respect to z. Well, partial of xy with respect to z is zero. So that's gone. And the partial of z with respect to z is one. So this expression is just one. Last but not least, for our dz dt, we look up there and say z is equal to t. So the derivative of that is also 1, coincidentally. Now you can tidy that up if you want. And in fact, you should, because that's kind of ugly and it doesn't take but a second. The other thing while we tidy that up is we're going to substitute in for uh, and get rid of our x's and y's. So this first y is going to be sine of t times negative sine of t plus x is going to be cosine of t times cosine of t plus one. Now that tidies up as negative sine squared of t plus cosine squared of t plus one. And we've done it, our second derivative. Not the second derivative, but rather our second example of calculating a derivative using the chain rule. All right, our next example, w is equal to x plus 2y plus z squared with x is equal to r over s, y is equal to r squared plus the natural log of s, and z is equal to 2r. This one is a little bit different. So how many variables do we have here? And what type of variables do we have? Well, since w is a function of x, y, and z, you can think of this as w equals uh, some function f of x, y, and z, where f is this expression. It's got three intermediate variables. How many independent variables? Well, since x, y, and z, x, y, and z are all functions of either r or r and s, they all, we're going to treat them all as if they have two independent variables. Um, mm -hmm. Even though z doesn't have an s in it, we can still think of z as a function of r and s. It's just 2r. Whoops. All right, so we need to, first and foremost, draw ourselves some tree diagrams. So the first tree diagram we're going to do is we're going to start with w. All right, so we'll put w right up here. We've got our dependent variables, our intermediate variables, and then our independent variables at the bottom. So we got w. Well, how many inputs does w have? It has uh, x, y, and z. x, y, and z. OK, now, how many inputs do each of x, y, and z have? Well, there's kind of, there, there are two ways to do this. You can generate two tree diagrams, or you can do what I'm going to do, which is just say, OK, x has two inputs, r and s. Y has two. Oh, this is going to get too cramped. I should have done this bigger. You know what? Let's do it. Let's actually do this a little bit bigger so we got more room. It'll only take us a second. No big deal. All right. So W goes to X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z. X goes to R and S. I'm sorry, I said, yeah, X goes to, I labeled this guy Y, X one should be Y. Y has two inputs, R and S. And Z has two inputs of R and S. And maybe now you can see why they're called tree diagrams. 
Uh, some of the other ones we've seen have looked like straight lines or diamonds, but this one definitely looks like a tree. Alternatively, you can draw two of these where you've got W goes to X, Y, and Z, and then X, Y, and Z go to R, and then another one of those where it goes to S at the bottom, but I kind of like doing it in one diagram. Okay, so what derivatives are we going to, what derivative are we going to get? Well, since W has two independent variables, if you go from the top all the way down to the bottom, there are two independent variables, we're going to end up with two derivatives here. Well, before we do that, we should probably label our branches. W has more than one input, so these are all going to be partials. Del W, partial W with respect to X, partial W with respect to Y, partial W respect to Z. Now, each of X, Y, and Z all have two inputs as well, so there are going to be no single variable derivatives here. These are all going to be partials. Uh, partial X with respect to R, partial X with respect to X, partial Y with respect to R, partial Y with respect to X, uh, S rather, partial Z with respect to R, partial Z with respect to S. Oh, my goodness. Now, this is going to be so we got to follow our noses carefully here, folks. I think we can do it. So what possible derivatives can we talk about W having? Well, W is going to have two partial derivatives. W is going to have the partial derivative with respect to R, and W is going to have the partial derivative with respect to X, since it's got two independent or kind of innermost variables, if you will. So I may end up overlapping things a little bit here. So I'm going to start with yellow. We're going to first do the partial derivative of W with respect to R. So I'm going to, as always, start with W, follow it down a branch. But now I have a choice. I could go left or right. Well, I'm interested in the derivative with respect to R, so I want to go down to the R branch. There's our first two expressions that we're going to multiply together. Multiply vertical branches and add the results together. Partial W respect to X times partial X with respect to R. Add to that our next branch. Again, returning up to W, now we're interested in Y, and we're going to follow that one down to R as well. So that's going to give us partial W with respect to Y, partial Y with respect to R. And if you're noticing that the uh, kind of uh, diagonals of these fractions, the delta X, delta X, delta Y, delta Y, that's not an not a altogether coincidence. Okay, and now we're going to add the next branch. Follow it to Z and then down to R. See that we get two more partials. Partial of W with respect to Z. Partial of Z with respect to R. Now, that takes care of R. We got all the way from the dependent variable to the independent ones. Now we need to follow our nose. Uh, we'll do this one in green, because why not? Green's a nice color. So I'm going to once again start at W head down, but this time instead of going to R, I'm going to go to S. And that'll give us partial W with respect to X for first branch, and then subsequent lower branch, partial X, partial S this time, not R, plus our next branch. Start at W. I need my highlighter. It's not letting me grab it. All right. Heading down the W branch to Y, now down to S. We get partial W par with respect to Y, partial Y with respect to S. And our last branch, you can probably already see the punchline, follow it down to Z and then down to S, gives us partial W with respect to Z, partial Z with respect to S. All right, on to our next slide. So there they are in, in nicer handwriting than I have. And I do believe we're gonna have to fill these in, yep. So the derivative of W, the partial derivative of W with respect to, uh, we need to find a bunch of pieces. I'm sorry, I just coughed, so let me pause this. Alrighty, first we need the partial of W with respect to X. So for all of these, we're gonna be looking at our W expression. The 
partial of w with respect to x. Well, the derivative of w with respect to x is just going to be one. Whoops, sorry about that. Now the derivative of uh, the partial derivative of x with respect to r. Well, now we're going to look here. I'm going to go ahead and pre-highlight some stuff. That way we can just plow forward when it comes time to get there. All right, now we're ready to proceed. So the partial of x with respect to r is r over s. Well, 1 over s is a constant. Derivative of r is just 1, so it's going to be 1 over s. Plus derivative of w, partial derivative of w with respect to y, that's going to be 2. And now the partial derivative of y with respect to r is going to be 2r. <laughs> L and MS is a constant, so there's derivative of zero with respect to R. And last but not least, in red, we're going to take the partial derivative. Uh, no, not yet. We better do the, the partial of W with respect to Z. That's going to give us twice times Z. And now, now we're ready for red, the partial of Z with respect to R times just two. Tidy that up. We get one over S plus four R plus four Z. Now, should we leave it this way? Probably not, because we would like it if our answer were only in terms of independent variables, R and S only. We won't be able to get rid of that S, and that's OK. So we'll substitute in for the Z, and we'll get 1 over S plus 4R plus 4. Well, Z is the same thing as 2R. Substitute that in. That's going to give us 8R plus 4R. The partial derivative of w with respect to r is 1 over s plus 12r. OK, on to the next example. Again, partial derivative of w with respect to x, well, that's 1. Uh, notice that these are actually all going to be the same. Partial derivative of w with respect to y, that's 2. Partial derivative of w with respect to z, that's 2z. So we can kind of borrow a little bit of the work that we just did because those uppermost branches are the same. Now it's where the lower branches are that they differ. So the derivative of x, partial derivative of x with respect to s, that's going to be negative rs to the negative second power. Why? Because r over s is equal to rs to the negative first power. Take your derivative of the s expression, negative one rs to the negative two. Okay. Add to that uh, plus 2 times the partial derivative of y with respect to x. Well, that's the derivative of ln of s, which is going to give us 1 over s. And then last but not least, highlighted in red, the derivative of z with respect to s, the partial, is 0 because 2r is a constant when you're differentiating with respect to s. And so tidying up this expression, we have that the partial derivative of w with respect to s is negative r over s squared plus um, 2z and z as 2r. No, that's 0. Sorry. Plus 2 over s. Sorry about that. I'm looking at the wrong line there of work. OK, and so now we're ready. Those are some examples of working chain rule, using the chain rule to find some derivatives. Now we're going to talk about implicit differentiation. So we're going to start with an example. We're going to say that we have an equation in x and y uh, with y uh, being a function of x. And so what do we really mean here? Well, you have x comma y. But y is a function of x. So you could think of this as kind of x comma f of x. If I wanted to, I could have it x and then x expressions. So the method to do this is we want to set it equal to 0 first. So here's our example. y squared minus x squared plus 3 is equal to sine of xy. So we'll move that sine of xy from the right to the left. And that way, we have our equation set equal to 0. And now we're going to, re, we're going to think of this new equation as some equation, capital F of xy. Now it's got two inputs. And uh, it just happens to be set equal to 0. And so we've, we've invented kind of a new, new function, new multivariable function, um, f of x, y, 
is equal to y squared minus x squared plus 3 uh, minus sine of x y. So if this thing is differentiable, which it is, because we just have a polynomial expression and sine of xy, nothing really can go wrong here. Then the derivative of y with respect to x is given by negative the partial derivative of capital X with respect to x over the partial derivative of capital F with respect to y. So if we worked this out, we'd have to calculate these derivatives. So f of x is our new expression. So the partial derivative of capital F with respect to x, we're going our way through it. Well, derivative of y squared is 0. Derivative of minus x squared is minus 2. So that's where that comes from. Plus 3 is 0. And derivative of minus sine of xy, well, there's a chain rule involved there. So derivative of the outside function, derivative of sine is going to give us cosine down here evaluated the unchanged inside function of xy times the derivative of the inside function, the derivative of xy with respect to x is just y. Similarly, in the denominator, we're going to have the derivative with respect to y of this expression. Okay, the derivative of y with respect of this expression with respect to y is going to be 2y minus 0 plus zero minus minus again another chain rule derivative of the outside function sine is going to give us cosine of evaluated the unchanged inside function xy times the derivative of xy with respect to y is just x. Okay putting that all together and tidying it up you get the expression on the bottom. I went ahead and took this negative sign in front and uh, distribute it through on the top numerator expression to get positive 2x and plus y cosine xy in the numerator. OK, so the question people are probably thinking, I know I would be thinking at this point, is why? Why does this work? All I did was just tell you the method and show you an example of applying the method. So let's let's explore this just a little bit further and see if we can convince ourselves why it's okay to do this and how and why it works. And why is it in the chain rule section? So uh, for our function, capital F of x, y is equal to zero. Um, dy dx is equal to negative, the partial of capital F over partial of capital Y. And this is why it works. So same criteria, let capital F of x, y be differentiable, have it be set equal to zero, and it is, and it arise, it arises from a, an expression which has y implicitly defined as a differentiable function of x. In other words, y is equal to f of x, little f of x, different from capital F of x. So uh, consider instead of using capital F, you know, since y is a function of x, we can think about the derivative with respect to just x, you know? So we're going to name a new variable here, and that's going to be w, and it's going to be capital F, w of x, which is going to be capital F of x, y. And we have this thing set equal to zero. So what the second part of this after the implication arrow means is w of x, since f, capital F of x, y is equal to zero, then w of x is equal to zero. Now calc one skills, if we were to take the derivative of w with respect to x, well, the derivative of zero is, well, zero is a constant, so the derivative of the constant is just zero. So dw dx is zero. Okay, why can we do this? Well, let's draw ourselves a little branch diagram here. Well, w uh, of x is a function with respect to x because f of x y is really f of x comma f of x. Oh, that was bad. Let's read it again. Capital F of key inputs x comma f of, little f of x. Uh, since it's all in terms of x, that means we can talk about w with respect to a single variable derivative of x. So let's try and draw a, t, a tree diagram here, which a little bit of poor coding of this slide means that I've got the wrong the punchline showing here, but that's okay. We'll let it we'll let it go. Okay, ready? So we're going to start up here with my dependent variable. That's going to be w, uh, which is equal to 
capital F. Well, I'm gonna let's get that X in there before I go further. W of X is equal to capital F of X comma Y. There we go. All right, how many inputs does capital F have? Well, capital F has input X over here, and it has input Y is equal to F of X. Okay, so we've got two inputs. We're gonna have partial derivatives for these branches, partials. Now there's a little bit of a hand wave and a little bit of a stretching of our imagination here. X is kind of has itself as its input. All right, so that's that's a bit of a stretch. So instead of justifying it that way, let's let's think about it over here. Y is equal to f of x. Well, that definitely y has an input of x. Well, that's kind of an incomplete tree diagram, if you will. And so what we need is to kind of complete this tree diagram out. We're going to need to fill in that little that little line. And it's a little bit of a stretch here, but we can we can wrap our heads around it and say, hey, a variable has itself as its own input. That doesn't seem totally unreasonable to do. All right, so now for these bottom branches, how many inputs do we have? We only have one input, and so they're going to be traditional derivatives. So this left upper branch is going to be del w, sorry, partial w, partial x, uh, and then the bottom branch is going to be dx dx. Looks kind of funny, and it does reduce to one, and that's going to be fine. Um, and then up here, we're going to have partial of w with respect to y, and then dy, dx, and then following our branches down like this, sure enough, we get partial w with respect to x, and dx, dy, and then following the right branch path, we get partial w with respect to y, dy, dx. Okay, so now what can we do with this expression? All right, well, let's, uh, let's write this in. Well, if you're looking at this and saying, okay, well, what is this? Well, W is the same thing as capital F. So the partial of W with respect to X, I could write it as the partial of capital F with respect to X, that's the same. And then DX DX, well, the derivative of X with respect to X is just one, that, that's reasonable. Remembering that D DX 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 is equal to the derivative with respect to X of X which is just one. So yep, that's okay too. Now the partial of W with respect to Y can be rewritten as capital F, uh, the partial of capital F with respect to Y, and now the derivative of Y with respect to X. You know what, we're just gonna leave this as dy dx. Why? Because don't forget the punchline, that is the thing that we are after. But now you can maybe see how I've managed to relate dy dx and those capital f x but wait so far i have this thing all equal to dw dx what does that mean well how can i fix that well don't forget this fact dw dx is zero so we can go ahead and replace the left hand side of this expression with zero now we've got an equation relating everything in green highlighted above and it just becomes a relatively painless algebra um, exercise to algebra that into shape. The first thing we'll do is we'll move that f of x over. There's where you get your ne negative partial of f with respect to x is equal to partial of f with respect to y, dy, dx. And I'm out of room, so we're going to go up over here. And then sure enough, dy, dx on the right-hand side. By multiplying by 1 over the partial of f with respect to y, we get partial of f with respect to y in the numerator, partial, sorry, partial of f with respect to x in the numerator, partial of y, f with respect to y in the denominator, and don't forget your negative, uh, negative sign out in front, and we've done it. We've managed to convince ourselves reasonably well that implicit differentiation works if we just kind of turn it into capital F of x, y, and set it equal to zero. We can do this nice, nice uh, approach. And that's it for the chain rule.